so welcome to From the Heart, a podcast from the Heart Sense Research Institute. And my name is Louise Livingstone, and I'm the founder of the Heart Sense Research Institute. And today I'm in conversation with Danny Hawkyard. Um, so Danny is a full-time artist and also currently studying for an MA in Myth, Cosmology and the Sacred at Canterbury Christchurch University. And Danny also uh, runs Waterhorse Artistry. Um, and I think your artist name is Mary, Mary Moonhawk, as I think that's right, yeah. Um, and it's a website, beautiful, beautiful website, um, dedicated to wild and whimsical art, inspired by magic, folklore and the natural world. And you've got some really beautiful pieces of work on there, Danny. Thank you. So, um, and just to sort of say um, how we know each other. So um, you and I share a particular passion, don't we, for sort of dialoguing with nature and expanding deeper into the, the sort of unknown um, and mystical realms of nature. And so I've invited you along today to talk about um, uh, your creative project uh, that you have completed for your masters. And as, as I read your work and saw your work, I just felt such a pull on my own heart, such a you know, depth of heart in your work. And so I've invited you along to talk a little bit about your project um, and, and one particular part of your project, which I guess you'll talk about in a minute. So I'm going to shut up now, Danny. I'm going to hand over to you and um, tell us about your, your project. So I did a creative project, as you, Louise, will know. On, uh, my project was on masks. I had a profound experience during last summer um using masks in kind of a, a ritualistic setting um which is a very long story so i'm not gonna go into it on this occasion but um it really kind of opened my eyes to the transformative power of the mask and you know it's a well-known fact that you know people and communities and cultures have been using masks in ritual and ceremonial practice um usually religious and spiritual practice for i mean they think it's estimated around forty thousand years people have been doing this and you know we kind of know this but it wasn't until i started really looking into it that i realized why you know that these these seemingly kind of mundane objects have the ability to kind of turn us into something else um and so I went away and I wanted to kind of do a project all about this, this power of the mask. And my own kind of personal background is in kind of Celtic Druidry and Celtic folklore, British folklore, um, and particular kind of animal symbolism um, in relation to the Celtic traditions. Um, so I decided I wanted to make a series of animal masks. And um, I made four in total. Um, I made a stag, a raven, a fox, and a salmon. Um, and one of them in particular um, is the stag that we're going to talk about today. Wonderful. So, yeah, so and I spent a lot of time kind of working with all of the masks, but the stag in particular, I think, was the one with, at this point, with the most powerful message. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and I think that's really the reason why um, I asked you to, to have this chat with me, really, because when I, when, when you showed me your work and you showed me the mask and you showed me the message that had come from you having worked with this mask and, and, and sort of brought this particular being into, um, into existence, um, when I read the accompanying work and the accompanying message, it just felt so profound. So could you talk a little bit, did, did the mask arrive first and, and then the message or? In this case, yeah, very much so. Um, I mean, all of the animals, I kind of, when I started with them, I kind of had an idea, you know, in my head of what I wanted them to look like. Um, I have a very visual imagination, so I can often kind of see things before I commit them to paper or commit them to sculpture in this case. Um, 
so I kind of had an idea kind of how I wanted them all to, to appear and kind of obviously I picked these animals you know there's so many animals in the Celtic tradition and I picked these four for a reason because they're very they have very strong symbolism um, and a lot of interesting kind of folklore that goes along with them so I had a kind of maybe an idea of what these animals meant to me symbolically but throughout the creative process itself the other three the raven the fox and the salmon all kind of sort of they were kind of like little children kind of niggling at me while I was creating them you know they kind of sort of things arose and things happened while I was creating them and I had little epiphanies while I was making them that made me kind of change my plans mm -hmm. as to how they looked whereas with the stag he conforms almost exactly to the drawings that I did of him initially yeah. I started out by drawing them on paper before I started creating them and he was the only one to really conform exactly to how he was on paper um, and hadn't really said a word to me at all um, you know in, in sort of metaphorically speaking mm -hmm. he hadn't he hadn't spoken he was silent the whole time and so it, that was the reason why I kind of picked him up and why he was the first one that I chose to do any kind of further um, sort of imaginal investigation with mm. um, because I was I was curious as to whether the reason that he he wasn't speaking to me was because he was too much of a left-brained creation if you know what I mean in sort of McGilchrist's in McGilchrist's divided brain theory and in his words whether he was too much born of my kind of my planning rational um analytical left brain that had made all my plans and worked out what equipment I needed and put them all together and he'd followed all of that exactly whereas the others had kind of taken on a life of their own and they sort of deviated from my plans and become something different and kind of grew their own characters as a result whereas the stag hadn't done that and I thought, is it because I, I planned him too much or he was too clear in my head before? Was he too, you know, was he too left, too much of my left brain and, and nothing of my right? And that was why I couldn't hear him. So the message for, him, for with him definitely came after the, the process of creation, because that was the reason why I sat with him over the other three. It's absolutely fascinating, Danny, you know, that you've got this... Um real sense of difference between the process of creating the stag and the process of creating the three other masks mm -hmm. and that you know the, the three others seem to be chattering away to you and the, the stag was was silent really um and do you feel that was um a message that he continued to carry as you worked with him you know this sort of sense of silence yeah it definitely felt very poignant um and i wasn't expecting it to at all um and obviously as you'll know from kind of doing this kind of sort of transpersonal or um sort of imaginal work kind of the sort of the key to really getting into that kind of stuff and having a, a successful experience with that kind of work is kind of having the capacity to be surprised you know that you're, you're you're not so your ego isn't controlling the process too much um and being able to sort of let go and allow things to unfold kind of naturally um without your intentions or your assumptions perhaps about what's going to come out of it having any holes on it those kind of slip away and it all becomes a very natural process as if you were communing with another person um so yeah it's it's a very strange experience doing that kind of work, I think. But yeah, it, it definitely is. It's the capacity to be surprised, I think, mm. that's kind of key with that kind of thing, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, it, you know, it, it makes sense. It makes sense to me, particularly from, um, you know, a, a kind of active imagination point of view or a, a, Gertian, um, a Gertian inquiry kind of lens, which is this kind of 180 degree shift out of the, the sort of rational brain into a kind of more intuitive, participatory, experiential relationship with, with the world, which, which is something that we're not quite used to doing in, in our contemporary world. So it certainly, it certainly makes sense to me that um, you know, things that you're in relationship with 
phenomena that you're in relationship with, in this case, a mask, um, that they, when, when you're working with them, um, they kind of take on a little life of their own. But they can be nicely framed in a, a, a kind of um, depth psychology sense, if you like, you know, that um, there are parts of the human experience that, that are hidden from us. And so using, um, say, uh, the methodology of the active imagination in this sense that you're using, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but using active imagination in that way helps to bring forth something which is hidden from ordinary everyday consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't kind of, because you asked whether his kind of silence was something that kind of carried through and it wasn't, yeah. um, you know, it, it was a surprise to me that, it, it was carried through. I hadn't really thought too much about it until I actually kind of sat down with him afterwards. And this, it was almost like a mushroom cloud, really. Kind of, I, I kind of sat down and it started sort of focusing on him, and the whole thing just kind of erupted. And I couldn't really, con you know, it was completely uncontainable. Um, so it, it's, yeah, it definitely took on a life of its own at that point. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Is there any way, Danny, we could um, have a look at this lovely stag? I'm sure, you know, the people watching would, would love to have a look at him right now. Yeah, he's right here. Just to make sure he's the right way up. There we go. Oh, wow. Look at him. Absolutely gorgeous. And so how long did it take you to, to create him? I actually truthfully don't know, um, because obviously I was kind of bobbing backwards and forwards and making all four of them at the same time. So I did all the, um, all the sculpting underneath. So um, this um, sort of the pronounced uh, bridge of his nose and his forehead that you can see here. Yeah. Underneath that, all sculpted out of, it's just newspaper. It's just okay. sculpted out of newspaper and masking tape. Mm -hmm. And I did all four of them. And that was probably a day, two days work um, doing that. Probably a bit more actually, because the raven, I had to make an entire wire framework for the mm -hmm. beak and, Mm -hmm. um, had to sort of do like um framework for the ears and things like that so um i couldn't tell you how long this one especially took but i think the process making all three of them probably uh, four of them sorry probably took the best part of a month okay uh, it was very consistent work um because i did those i did all the sort of the sculpting work underneath with the newspaper and any skeletal structures that i needed to support it um, and then I went back and did um, sort of a paper mache shell over the top um, to set it all in place. So it's completely solid now. Um, yeah. There's a little bit in it, but not a lot. <laughs> um, and then with him, um, I've used just PVA glue and sort of shredded fabric over the top. And obviously I had to wire the, because these are real antlers, the antlers that are on wow. the ground here. Beautiful. Um, those had to be attached and um, handmade a, his talisman. So yeah, it was, it's quite a lot of work all in all. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it looks incredible. And, and I suppose the more that you worked with him, did he kind of take on a little character and personality of his own? Not until afterwards. No. He was probably actually, even though when he was actually, the first animal I decided to do, one thing I've always wanted to do was to make um, a Celtic horned god mask. Mm. So when I made the decision that I was going to do kind of masks as this project um, and decided I was going to do animal masks, um, the stag was the first one I wanted to do. But actually when I finished the four of them, he was probably actually my least favourite, if I'm honest. Right. Because I just, I had no connection with him. Right. He was, it was almost like he was too... Yeah, he, he was just completely as expected. It was just not boring. Boring is completely the wrong word, but they didn't really feel, yeah, I didn't really feel like I had any kind of rapport with him at all. Mm. Um, whereas I had, I felt like I had kind of a tangible connection with all of the others. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, so even though he was kind of the one that sort of started the whole thing, as it were, he was the first one. He was sort of the grandfather of the project. Mm. Um, yeah, he was, I didn't kind of feel like I had any much of a relationship at all with kind of the archetype or with, with it as a physical object at all until I'd actually sat down and done work with him after I'd created him. Yeah. 
And I suppose really, um, because I'd I'd like to sort of talk to you about um, the the message that that you had from him, because that was deeply profound for you, wasn't it? I think you said that, that there was such a shock and a surprise there because, you know, he was your least favorite. There was nothing really coming from him. And then what happened, Danny? What happened with regards to the message that he had to give you? Well, because, as I said, because um, he was the one that I had kind of hadn't heard a peep out of him, so to speak, um, I thought, you know, I need to, I feel like I need to do something to, to I, need, I need to try, you know, I felt like I need to try and get something more from him before this yeah. project comes to a close. Um, and so it was just one evening kind of out of the blue. I hadn't been planning to do it. I think I was actually halfway through doing my, my academic write-up of the project. Um, and I kind of finished early one evening. I thought I've probably done enough for today, but I don't really feel like I want to stop. Um, and just on a bit of a whim, I thought I'll just sit with sit with the stag for a little while and see what comes through. And we'd done kind of exercises before on the MA um, using uh, Mary Angelo's um, methodology of inviting images to teach. Um, and on that particular occasion, um, uh, on the MA when we'd done it, we'd been sent off to Canterbury Cathedral, which is, as you know, is absolutely stunning, um, to find an image there and, and sit with it and, and work with it in some way. Um, whether we, you know, you can, uh, um, Mary, Mary Angelo's methodology kind of proposes dropping into a kind of a state of reverie or a, a meditative state or some kind of altered state of consciousness where the image is allowed to to speak to you without too much, again, without too much conscious interference mm -hmm. on the part of kind of your ego or your conscious mind. And there were various ways of doing that. You can, you can sit and draw, you can write poetry, you can sit and write narrative, or um, obviously if you weren't in somewhere like a cathedral, you could sit and write music or, you know, whatever, it will just meditate on it, whatever it is that works for you. Um, there's so many ways that you can engage with images in this way and because I'd found it so successful when I'd done it in the cathedral I'd had a, quite some quite profound experiences as a result of that particular activity I thought well I'll do what I did then I'll, I'll sit and I'll sit and draw him and see what and see what comes through um, and I find that kind of for me the best way of sort of dropping into sort of a state where um a state where, that allows something else to come through um dropping into an altered state of consciousness or a state of reverie for me is sort of most easily achieved in this setting by just kind of writing what i think what i feel just almost like um not really poetry but kind of like a, like prose about where i am what i'm feeling what i'm doing um or any musings or thoughts that i might be having mm -hmm. um and my intention was just to do that. And then once I felt that I'd kind of settled in that space, just to pick up my sketchbook, you know, I propped him up on my table. I sat down with a, a cup of tea and I had my notepad and my sketchbook and I was all, all set to go. And I wrote a couple of verses of prose and all of a sudden my pen was just racing across the page and I was having a full blown transference dialogue with him, a full blown conversation in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. Um, kind of, and, and I was speaking out loud. I was conscious of the fact that I was talking out loud to him. Right. And I'd had no intention of doing so at all. Um, it just kind of happened by accident, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and took you by surprise, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> really, really did. Because um, as I said, I was intending to sit and draw him. I'd got my sketchbook, I'd got all the yeah. equipment I needed, and I didn't even touch it in the end. Gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> And um, yeah, you, you talk about um, uh, transference uh, dialogues, Danny, and um, you know, these, these are really um, important spaces um, for us to, um, I think Robert Romanishin, the, the depth psychologist, um, in, in his own work, in his own methodology, has adapt, adapted these, a process called transference dialogues where you kind of fall into, you talked about this, a reverie or a, or a daydream. You fall yeah. into a kind of daydream where uh, Ramanishin actually says, you dream the subject matter of your work with your eyes wide shut. So you're kind of asleep yet you're awake at the same time and you're sort of moving between these um, sort of uh, very um, physical um, day to day 
um, experiences and bringing up things from your subconscious, from the hidden, from, from the other realm, um, which doesn't mean to say that, you know, because we don't see them on a day to day basis, they're not there. It's just that we've lost the ability to connect to those spaces. Um, and so the transference dialogues, really, they help to open out into the unfinished business of the other in the work. And I suppose for you, you were kind of called. It feels to me like you've been called or claimed by by the stag, by by your creative project, by this work. So and and then in a kind of reverie or daydream, that was where the stag or the work that claimed you started to talk to you. Um, and, and this particular process is, is actually based on uh, Carl Jung's um, understanding of the active imagination. So it's deeply powerful. Um, and whereas I think Carl Jung actually um, developed active imagination between patient and therapist, Robert Romanishin has kind of extended that a bit further to say, well, actually, because there is conscious and, and unconscious within us all and within the world itself, that actually, why can't the research or the work that you're doing actually call you and, 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 and sort of um, those hidden depths call you into its space? And that's really what you're doing. You're creating a space in those reveries to kind of dive into those deeper spaces that we wouldn't normally access on a day to day basis. Um, and like you say, then, you know, your pen starts flying across the page and, and this dialogue comes out the, the words of this stag start to uh, appear. It's just incredible, really. Yeah, and it's uh, something that Angelo talks about a lot as well, kind of that, um, you know, sort of giving life to sort of uh, daemons. Yeah, you know, the, you know, it's, it's sort of, she talks about it as being sort of commune with imaginal beings or imaginal mm. entity. Mm. And whether you choose to view those as something um, spiritual or something um, godlike or deity-like or something something else, some other kind of ethereal being, yeah. or, or whether you choose to view that as a facet of your own unconscious mind is, I guess, dependent on your own personal world mm. view. Um, but I think regardless of where you kind of stand on that spectrum, it's it can be a really fascinating um, exercise. Absolutely, absolutely. Believing something else or part of part of yourself. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. The revelations you can have as a, a result of working in that way are, mm. are really quite astounding. I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I was so deeply moved by the dialogue that you had with your stag. Um, and uh, we had a little practice, didn't we, before we started <laughs> chatting. Um, so do, do you feel ready to, to kind of do this um, yeah. dialogue Bring. between you and, <laughs> you and the stag? Because I think, you know, the, 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 the listeners would be uh, really interested to hear that. And is, is there enough uh, kind of strength in your arm to actually hold the stag whilst, whilst we're reading it? Are you, are you able to do that? Because I'm sure we'd love to see him too talking to us. I'm sure I can I'm sure I can manage that. <laughs> a little bit gonna turn pages. <laughs> and it's a real, you know, just just to say this is a real profound message for our time. You know, and 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 this is why I wanted to talk to you so much because you know this message is from the heart. It's it's a cry, I think, from um our, our animal kind our animal kin and brethren um the earth and all of her species calling out to us as human beings at this time to say hey we're talking to you and you know there are ways of listening and and what you've done is you know sort of opened up a pathway to to hear this this amazing voice so let's go and, and i'm just saying to the to the listeners as well that um i'm going to be the voice of the stag so, and Danny's going to be reading the, uh, the, the prose that she, uh, that she wrote. Stag has been silent this whole time. Is he not speaking to me? Or am I not listening? I sit him down, propping him up on the table in front of me and settle with a cup of tea in my armchair. I find that writing tangled poetry prose and thoughts about what I see and feel slips me easily into the space I need to be in to commune with imaginal beings. I begin. I see the great stag. He sits before me, motionless. He says not a word. 
His ears hang low. He seems tired. He watches me. His mottled fur, his patchwork face, his dark eyes, his proud horns, a testament to the majesty that once was. How did he end up mounted upon an unworthy hunter's wall? Fleshless, heartless, lifeless. It is in this moment that my heart starts to race. I notice I'm frowning. My change in demeanour signals to me that I am no longer sitting alone. The daemon of the stag has settled in the room. I was intending to sit receptively and draw him, but my pen begins racing across my page and I find I'm speaking out loud. How did you end up here, O oh stag? I ask him quietly. You know how, he says shortly. Do you really need my affirmation? I want to hear you say it. I respond. Why? I think for a moment. Why indeed? Because it will be good for you, I realise aloud. And because we need to hear it too. By we, I mean humans. He says nothing. How did you end up on someone's wall? I ask again. Humankind, Stag says simply, matter of factly. They grow too large, too fast, like weeds. They do not understand the power they wield, much less what to do with it. They do not understand that to be king is to be humble, to be great is to be kind. He pauses. No kindness was shown to me. Bitterness. I sense your resentment, I venture. Yes. Regret sits heavy in my heart. I'm sorry. It doesn't seem enough. He puts my feelings into words. Sorry does not bring back the life that I lost. You didn't lose it, I say without thinking. It was stolen, like your crown. Yes. He seems a creature of few words, lest I pry them out of him. It's a beautiful crown, I offer, admiring his antlers. He is quiet for a moment, then slowly. Thank you for giving it back to me. It was a pleasure. It was not mine to keep. But resituating it upon my head does not restore my power nor the balance of the world, he warns. No, I know that, I reply. It's why I ask you to teach, to speak with me. Nothing. So that we might learn from you, I add hopefully. Please don't leave yet. The energy in the room seems to ripple, as if he is shifting in his seat upon my table. He finally speaks. I am old. I am tired. I was king once, as were my kin. Our crowns have been mounted upon your walls, our hearts bled out, and our souls betrayed. The other animals do not treat us such. I know he is right. Humans are despicable. Even the mighty raven of the skies honours me above himself, for he has not lived as long as I have lived nor seen what I have seen. He is wearing a talisman of raven's feathers. I am speechless at his unexpected, although not violent, outburst. I don't know what to say. He has receded into silence again. I'm embarrassed, I finally confess. Do not be, he says bluntly, though not unkindly. It will not help you nor me. What should I do? I feel a quiet desperation building in my chest. I'm lost. You can take me back to the forest, return me to the earth, lay me to rest. Images flash through my head then, of dismantling the mask I've made for him, of carrying the antlers up to the woods, of seeking out a suitable burial site, perhaps having a small funerary rite. I realise I'm scowling again. Why am I so opposed to his suggestion? Am I just being selfish? 
or is it something more? I feel disrespectful knowing I'm about to ignore his wishes and I scrabble in my mind for justification. But if I do that, I say carefully, no one else will hear your story. No one else can sit with you like I do now. I pause for a moment and then I admit, and I, I don't want to let you go. My heart skips nervously with my confession. That's selfish. He snaps. I am not here for you. I know he isn't. But you were a king once, right? I press him. Does a king not have a duty to his subjects? To lead them? To guide them home when they go astray? He is pensive for a moment. I suppose I no longer think of you. He means humans. As my subjects. Well, you should, I retort, feeling irritated at his submission. I know he is tired, and I know I should cut him some slack, but he needs to realise. You are far wiser than we, and we are misguided. He regards me quietly from the dark depths behind his large eyes. Perhaps. He allows. Very well. Keep me with you if you must. But promise me that you will carry me with honour and with dignity. Do not be embarrassed if others frown at my crown of horns or grow frustrated when they do not understand. Something has alighted within him. My raggedy face may frighten them, those who aren't yet ready to be reclaimed by the wild, but ask them to sit with me all the same. You cannot preach to them the error of their ways. They must come to understand it on their own. Okay, I say. I think I understand. Thank you. But silence meets me again. He is gone. Thank you. That's deeply, deeply moving, Danny. Yeah, it still, uh, still seems to, every time I read it, even though I know kind of, you know, how it ends, as it were, mm. it uh, still seems to, it brings me to tears. Yeah. It's like, <clears throat> filling my heart with deep sadness. And so what was the sense that you, you had as he left? What did he want to leave us with, do you think? Well, <laughs> I mean, I felt it was kind of felt like we'd gone through the stages of him finally kind of conceding to very reluctantly help, but that it has to be done with, you know, his message has to be imparted with, with pride and with, with dignity and not in, you know, when we're dealing with this kind of stuff, when we're talking about, you know, any of the esoteric arts or um, imaginal beings or yeah, anything that's kind of perhaps a bit off the grid as far as um, what's kind of normally culturally or scientifically acceptable. Um, you know, we, we have a tendency when faced with kind of people who aren't um, sort of interested in this kind of stuff or aren't familiar with this kind of work, we have a tendency to kind of to hold back a bit. Mm. You know, we, we have a tendency to kind of go, well, you know, how, how much should I say? How, 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 how wild can I, can, I, can I go with this stuff in, in front of these people? Um, you know, you, we have a tendency to, to sort of rein things in a bit. Um, whereas his message was very much a case of, if you're going to insist on, on keeping me here, if you're going to insist on, um, you know, that I, if you're going to insist on me teaching my wisdom to to the world then don't you dare be embarrassed about it 
you know, go out there and, and hold those those antlers up high and mm. share him with people and share the message that he has to impart with people proudly and mm. confidently and not with um, any kind of, um, not to do so apologetically um, yeah. or cautiously. Does that make sense? Definitely. I mean, as I was reading his, um, what he was saying, it just felt like um, so strong, so powerful that actually now is not the time to hold back. Now mm -hmm. is the time for people to hear, um, you know, the voice of nature, the voice of the stag um, and to understand that, um, you know, all beings are just as important as human beings. And, and we're all part of a, a, a community of beings that call the earth our home. We, we all live here and we all deserve to be treated with, you know, kindness and respect. And that was yeah. certainly the message that, that I felt from him. Um, and that actually, if we can't learn that, then he's not interested in in you know sort of being part of any kind of support for us it's like you know i've i've what i felt was in, in what i was reading is i've done that i've been there i've tried to show you the way so many times and now it's kind of like i'm done and that's the sense yeah. i got from him and yeah. if you come to me then okay you know i will make the space but you know otherwise you're on your own and I kind of felt like that there was a, a sense of nature withdrawing mm -hmm. in that sense and that yeah. felt like um, deeply upsetting because all we have to do is is to to tune to tune ourselves to a different frequency and know that nature has never stopped talking those beings have never stopped talking it's just that we've stopped listening mm -hmm. so that's why your project and, and this dialogue was so deeply moving for me when I read it. And I just wanted you to share that with as many people as possible because it's such important work, Danny, that you're doing. Yeah. So, I mean, his sentiment was very much the kind of half-hearted measures here are not welcome yeah, for him. Yeah. All or nothing. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of what we're seeing now in the world, you know, it's, there's no more kind of pussyfooting around. No. Um, you know the, the issues the environmental issues the climate issues um you know, issues of deforestation of you know the poisoning of the seas animals losing their habitats and their homes you know no half measures are are no longer not only are they no longer sufficient but as far as nature or the animals or the universe is concerned they're no longer welcome yeah um, we need to pull our fingers out and we need to to do do more we need to we need to do better yeah yeah and it's it starts with this listening doesn't it it starts with this being willing to step into the space of another despite the fact that you might not speak the same language but there's the there's the language of um imagery and feelings and experience and sensuous experience and, and all of those things that that you opened yourself up to to bring that message forward and they are valid ways of knowing danny aren't they and let's yeah. you know if if we carry on it without bringing these ways of knowing into the world we're on a a, a, a kind of uh, our own um destruction trajectory really you know these ways of knowing have never gone away um and you know it's it's deeply important that we learn now to 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 learn how to communicate with the more than human world yeah and you know it kind of it left me with this very kind of a very heavy kind of sense of duty mm. um not in not in a, an unpleasant way that sounds like a negative thing i think when i say it like that but it did feel heavy yeah. um as i said that's not in a um that's not going to sort of criticize the message mm. um it just felt important yeah um, that i somehow needed to to take this work out into the world um and and you know his the the sentiment that 
you know, this is a message that people need to come to meet on their own terms kind of resonated with me in that not everybody is going to be able to get their heads around communing with imaginal beings. Um, you know, for some people that's understandably going to be, you know, a step too far. Um, and I was starting to think about, well, how can I make this accessible to people in a way that is kind of acceptable either to their worldviews or to their values, mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or lay this out in a way that people can kind of really engage with um, and, and understand and, and that's meaningful to them. And um, one of the first things that I kind of thought of doing that I'm still thinking um, I would like to do is to, because obviously I'm an artist, I'm an illustrator, um, but I'm also a writer. Um, I love to write, whether it's academic or fiction. Um, so my kind of particular thing I'm thinking about doing with his story is, is crafting it into an illustrated mm -hmm. novel um, for sort of aimed at kind of sort of teens or, or young adults perhaps um, to kind of take that story out in, in a very kind of visual, tangible, um, but magical way. Um, and to, to place this story on, um, on a level that people can, who perhaps aren't interested in this kind of academic work um, or aren't interested in this, um, you know, kind of the ontology of the imagination, the, the, the knowing that comes from working with the imagination in this way. Um, you know, that's not, ev not everybody's cup of tea and that's yeah. fair enough. Um, but something like an illustrated novel, I think, is something that can capture the imagination in the in the same way yeah um but perhaps more socially acceptable at this point in in our cultural history yeah i think that's a wonderful so idea that, so that's one of the things that i would very much like to do um mm. and i'd like to do something with um, with the others as well i want to do the same kind of sitting down and, and working with them and uh, and actually as i said to you earlier when we were chatting before we started recording i'm taking this project forward now into my dissertation thesis for, for the MA um, and doing, going to, I'm intending to do a lot more work with mm -hmm. these masks. And not just kind of um, sort of considering masks as a phenomenon in themselves because, you know, the, the psychology that the power of the mask rests upon is astounding and mm -hmm. I barely managed to scratch the surface of it in this project. So that's, part of what I want to go into, but I also want to go into working with these masks and looking at the other messages that they have to give us um, and the, these beings, these imaginal beings, um, or the demons of the animals. Um, so it's, it's quite exciting to see uh, what's, what's going to come through from uh, the other three because uh, the stag's one of four. So yeah. it's quite a, quite a lot, quite a lot more uh, information to come through if, uh, if I get it right. Yeah, it's wonderful and really, really exciting, Danny. Um, and, you know, if uh, if you wouldn't mind coming back on once you've done, you know, sort of more work with with the other three and, you know, talking about the messages that, that they're giving, um, I'm, I'm sure people would be really, really interested in, in sort of following your journey. So it's really, really exciting. Um, and yeah, we've learned so much from you tonight, so much from Stag. And, you know, I just want to say thank you to you and to Stag. And we, we're coming to the end of our time now. But um, is there, you know, sort of one final message that you think that Stag would want to give, um, you know, just, just a really kind of a short message before we, we sign off this evening? Mm, that's a very good question. I think, and uh, obviously this ties in very much with the kind of work that you're doing and um, you know, the kind of research that you're, you're doing, but I think it's just quite simply just be open-hearted, be receptive, be open-hearted, don't close off possibilities or ideas just because they seem a little obscure or because they they seem uncomfortable or perhaps aren't what we're used to um you know be open to experience and, and different ways of knowing the world um and engaging with it on on different levels or at least entertaining the possibility even if you can't subscribe to to it as a practice um yeah be open-hearted thank you
I think that's a really lovely place to leave it. I'm so grateful for you coming along, Danny, and for giving up your time and for bringing lovely stack. Can we just see him one last time before we say goodbye? Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to you, Danny, and thank you to Stag. And may we be, all be open hearted and, and move into uh, our collective futures um, for all beings in a way that, you know, the earth and all beings are given the opportunity to flourish. Um, and we look forward to having you back on again soon, Danny. Well, thank you so much for having us. <laughs> thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you have any comments, you can add your thoughts below. You might also like to join our mailing list. Please visit us at www.heartsenseresearch.co.uk to subscribe and to keep up to date with our work. On our website, you will also find lots of other resources, including research papers, lectures, blogs and details of further training and events. If you are inspired by our work or share our passion about bringing heart-centred approaches and awareness into the conversation at the level in our society at which important decisions are made, please do consider making a donation via our Just Giving page. The link is available on our website or below on this channel. All donations help us to continue our important work by taking seriously the wisdom and the guidance of the heart and working to give the heart a platform to speak in relation to key issues facing our world today. Thank you so much for your support and we look forward to reconnecting with you soon.